Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Pauli Murphy. Uh, I'm a senior fellow at the Institute. And uh, this afternoon, we have the great pleasure of welcoming uh, Dr. Fiona Hill with us. Uh, Fiona is a senior fellow at the um, Center on the US and Europe in the Brookings Institution in Washington. Um, she has written a very interesting book called uh, there is nothing uh, here for uh, you here, or there's nothing for you here, to be more exact, um, which um, gives an account of her odyssey, I suppose you could call it, uh, from Bishop Auckland in County Durham to uh, Washington, D.C., uh, by way of St. Andrews University in, um, in Scotland, uh, Harvard University, and the Brookings Institution and on the way um, a, a post in the uh, Security uh, Council of the United States. Um, Fiona, you're very welcome. Uh, I should say you're very welcome back um, to Ireland uh, because we had the honor of speaking to you already. <clears throat> Thanks, Parag. It's really great to be with you. I wish I was there in person, actually, but anyway, it's very <laughs> nice to even be there in Zoom. <laughs> yes. Um, Fiona, as I was saying, you, your book, um, and I was mentioning to you already, uh, my father could have said to me, as your father said to you, uh, there is nothing for you here. Um, I come from rural County Cork, uh, and indeed there was nothing for me. Um, and in, in some ways there, there were parallels between your um, experience growing up and uh, many Irish people. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there were uh, significant differences uh, because you grew up in, uh, let's say, what was formerly a relatively flourishing um, mining and steelmaking area. We grew up in rural Ireland uh, where there was and uh, never had been anything much except agriculture. Um, so if there was nothing uh, for us there, uh, we, and uh, in fact, had to emigrate uh, I'm a, a member of a family of six, uh, five of us emigrated and four came back. So there's been a lot um, uh, of change in the meantime. And you put a lot of emphasis on, on the importance of education, quite rightly. Uh, in fact, you end the book with a, a series of uh, recommendations on what might be done to promote talent like uh, that uh, you, you yourself had. Um, I find it all very interesting. Um, and. Uh, you're putting together um, of uh, the United States, the UK and Russia is also very interesting in that I, I suspect that what is behind it is that these three countries above all were the prime sites of what would be called the, the classical industrial revolution industries. Admittedly in, in, in Russia, it was late and it was forced by Stalin but it suffered in the Donbass and elsewhere from the same problems that you suffered from in County Durham. Um, and it's quite striking also, I think, that um, in, in all three countries, you forgive me for saying so, but um, you have um, the equivalent of Make America Great Again. Um, I mean, I'm not talking about Joe Biden, obviously, but uh, 74 million Americans think that this should be done. And what is happening in Russia today is another example of uh, you know, make Russia great again or bring back uh, the Russia that we all know and love. And um, I would think that um, a, a, a policy of having your cake and eat it is a good description of an empire. Uh, and in many cases, um, when we're trying to judge your native country, we sometimes think that the ambition is to go back to 1870. Uh, I don't know what you think about that kind of uh, thought. <clears throat> well, you know, I I think the you've just touched uh, program on those parallels. Um, you know, because obviously I did have in mind, you know, when I was uh, writing the book, uh, also about this, you know, whole shift in the UK, you know, post Brexit as well, with the whole idea of global Britain, mm. which you know, as you were saying there, there's kind of some connotations that are you know perhaps uh, not the most promising in you know the complex world that we're in now. And of course, you know, sitting, you know, where you are in Ireland, in Dublin, <clears throat> you know, that imperial history obviously has a pretty different um, uh, perspective, right? <laughs> you know, it's kind of, you know, we always talk of Ireland, I think, with a, an, an incredible amount of truth, not hyperbole is the first colony, you know, the place that, you know, kind of England practiced out on first. 
uh, and uh, you know, in terms of the kind of colonial rule that it would take around the world. We're still in the struggles now of the legacy of this, just as we are in um, Russia with Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but, you know, if we think about, you know, what's going on in uh, Ukraine today, and you mentioned the Donbass, I mean, there's an irony I mentioned in the book, by the way, that um, during the miners' strike in the UK in 1984, which is the time that I decided to study Russian, the miners' unions, um, you know, such as they were in the Soviet Union, although, you know, heavily orchestrated by the Russian uh, Soviet state, um, basically raised money for the miners of, uh, of the UK, and some miners' money from the Donbass ended up in County Durham. <laughs> And uh, Donbass, of course, now being the contested area in uh, Ukraine. And I got some of that money to go to study Russian <laughs> for a summer program as a, as a daughter of a coal miner. So I feel very responsible <laughs> now and a, and a big debt to the miners of the Donbass. And I'm really sorry about the predicament that they're in. But, you know, this is still dealing with the fallout from the imperial period. And, you know, all of the, as you said, the rapid industrialization and you know, kind of regional historic differences as well as geographic differences. You know, Putin has said that Ukraine isn't really a country. Mm. Uh, that you know, part of it was in Eastern Europe. You know, carved up by you know the various other empires of Austro-Hungary and uh, the German Prussian Empire um, in uh, the past, and others part under the Russian Empire. Well, you know, you could say that about all kinds of countries. And, you know, you could say that about Ireland. Mm -hmm. You could say that about Poland. You could say that about actually the entire United Kingdom because the borders have changed. Scotland was independent, you know, for long uh, periods of time. You know, pick your point in history and you've got a completely different configuration. Mm -hmm. But the grievances today that have, you know, pushed us forward to this idea of make, you know, whichever country great again, are really rooted in the period I talk about in the book that you've described, that period after you know, World War II, where there was the big buildup um, of mass manufacturing industry as well, on top of, you know, earlier periods. In the UK, you end up with the nationalization of industry that you don't really have in the United States, but you do have that big buildup of auto manufacturing and steel and also coal in the United States as a recovery from the war and moving into mass production. And in the Soviet Union, of course, you do have that huge buildup, the development of the oil and gas um, sector, as you said, under Stalin, but going up and up until the 1970s. And then when the economy changes, I mean, Ireland's experienced this as well. You go into a whole new phase from the you know, 70s and 80s onwards. Mm -hmm. And it's that sense of dislocation as you move away from heavy industry and in privatized, nationalized industries, which happened in the UK as well as in um, Russia after the collapse of the Soviet Union. They get an awful lot of people who find themselves that they've lost their work. They've lost the culture and the identity that grew up uh, around that work. They're kind of all adrift. And when somebody sort of steps up and says, look, you know, I'm going to fix this for you. This is the fault of globalization or this is the fault of this uh, group or that group. Mm -hmm. We're going to fix this. You know, we're going to find, you know, using the title of my book, something for you here again. We're going to put everything back for you. It becomes, you know, very seductive. And it's that mm -hmm. kind of impulse, you know, mm -hmm. to restore things mm -hmm. that, you know, helps to lead towards uh, this kind of phenomenon we're dealing with today. Um, I, I omitted to mention some housekeeping. <laughs> Uh, items uh, which I should do now, and that right. is to uh, tell our audience that uh, the event is on the record, both our exchanges and the question and answer afterwards, which should be in about uh, 15 to 20 minutes, um, and that uh, your questions can be posed using the uh, question and answer function at the bottom of your screen, um, and also that uh, the discussion can be followed on Twitter using the hashtag at IIEA. Um, to continue a bit on the um, path we were on, Fiona, um, it is also striking, isn't it, that um, the northeast of France and uh, notoriously the Ruhr in Germany and southern Belgium were also sites of this kind of early capitalism. Uh, but we don't seem to have witnessed the same kind of reaction there and uh, it seems to me that um, although it wasn't perhaps designed to meet the, precisely this eventuality, uh, the establishment of the European Coal and Steel Community in 1952 uh, might have something to, to, to do with it because it took the edge off the, the competition yeah. between France and Germany. And uh, it had a social component, which is very important in the European Union. 
that is a really great observation, Perik. In fact, you know, I haven't had somebody make that before, and I'm really grateful for you to point that out. Mm. Uh, because, you know, I have myself, you know, when I set off to write the book, I was going to do it quite differently. I was going to do more of a comparative uh, work then the pandemic hit and I got stuck where I'm still sitting talking to you now and I couldn't go out and do more you know research and so that was how I actually came upon using my own story and just focusing on the UK you know Russia and the United States and how there was very similar manifestations for you know these reasons mm -hmm. and then you know that broader comparative perspective I've been thinking about since then I mean in France we have seen a populist uprising mm -hmm. and regional differentiation but it's been more on that kind of divide you started with on the urban rural divide mm -hmm. the gilets jaunes the yellow vest movement in France that we could you know kind of say is a sort of a manifestation of grievance and you know that, that there has been some you know populist you know, um, elements of that and, you know, kind of uh, uh, Macron himself had to play the populist, you know, going out to town halls across um, all of France and engaging with people to, you know, try to manage that. That was really that divide of rural urban and uh, the, the French provinces feeling that they're left out of, you know, whatever's happening in Paris. In Germany, you've had more of an east-west west split, exactly as you said, not the old industrial heartland of West Germany, but the East German parts, where you saw the rise of the alternative for Deutschland, because they were left out of that earlier pact. And it's really been the stresses and strains since unification in uh, you know, 1990 that we've seen playing out. Of course, there are lots of regional divides in Germany as well, historically, you know, between North and South, not just the East and West that has persisted because of um, you know the uh, the divisions during World War II. Mm. But I think that's spot on. And that point about funds becomes very relevant now because we're going to have another major economic dislocation. We're in the middle of it. COVID has accelerated it um, uh, because of the nature of changing work, a rise of uh, artificial intelligence. You know, we're going to go into so much more automation. Um, all kinds of jobs have uh, changed. Um, and we're going to have to figure out how do we, and I get back to that theme of education in the book and that you mentioned that you and I benefited from, how do we give people the skills, it doesn't have to be through universities, but technical training, vocational training, apprenticeships, to deal with the way that work is going to shift. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think Ireland has actually done a bang up job on that. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, admittedly, you've still got, you know, out migration and other issues, but, you know, um, Ireland has reinvented itself. And you have been, you know, the centre of a lot of innovation, um, high tech um, industry, financial services. I mean, Brexit has seen a lot of people <laughs> moving to Dublin, you know, and away from London, for example. Uh, but, you know, that's uh, we're going to have to think about that. So how do we fund that? How mm. do we think about how we take the edge off this next transition? Yeah, yeah. Um, and then to go a, a little further into uh, the case of Russia and, uh, well, we all know that, Vladimir Putin uh, said some years ago that uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union was the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the, cent of the century. And you know, in some ways, one can understand what he's saying. Uh, but um, his more recent actions uh, put a different uh, edge on it. Um, and um, we know that uh, Tony Blinken and um, Sergei Lavrov have met uh, today and um, Apparently, um, the palavers are going to continue until next week. It's it's very difficult to figure out what exactly is going on, except that the, the massing of um, military uh, formations um, close to a border is a very dangerous uh, lever to use in negotiations, um, if indeed that is all that is intended. But even if that is all that is intended. It's still a very dangerous maneuver because things can go wrong all too quickly. What, what's your take on, on it? Well, I have exactly the same take that you do because mm. you know th there is that um, you know possibility that this is an elaborate bluff, and a lot of people mm. are suggesting that that you know kind of look, you know, it would be insane to invade uh, Ukraine again, uh, try to take Kiev, you know, move even into the western parts of Ukraine. There's all kinds of scenarios. I mean, clearly, uh, Putin um, and uh, the Russian military have amassed enough forces, equipment, men, you know, and um, other weaponry there to um, give themselves a range of options. You know, we've just heard that the um, 
Russian Navy is sending three amphibious um, assault vessels uh, from the Baltic to the Black Sea. I mean, talk about upping the ante there and suggesting that you're going to what, invade Odessa, take Mariupol. Well, actually, they'd have to go through the Sea of Azov, you know, for, for that. You know, so what, what, you know, what is all of this about? I mean, people are pouring over maps. People are pouring over satellite imagery and trying to, you know, figure out the full extent of this. And that is what exactly, as you said, what makes it dangerous, mm. because Putin is not the kind of person who um, wants to be seen to be just bluffing, mm. although he you know, understands the bluff and the power of a bluff and saber rattling and all the rest of it. But, you know, Putin's stock in trade has been to make good in some way on a threat. Mm. You know, he wasn't bluffing the first time uh, when um, he seized and annexed Crimea and sparked off you know, the war in Donbass. Um, and in fact, you know, they did try to set off insurgencies, you know, uprisings outside of uh, the current conflict zone in uh, uh, Donbass and Luhansk, going right all the way down, uh, you know, the, um, into uh, Ukrainian uh, territory, you know, to the approach of Crimea, Mariupol, you know, Kherson, you know, Kharkiv, and it didn't work out, you know, immediately after 2014. I think people have forgotten a lot of that. We've seen them intervene in Syria when we weren't expecting it, you know, quite so much. I mean, there's all kinds of, they invaded Georgia in 2008. You know, when people, you know, basically underestimate Putin or, you know, kind of basically try to call the bluff, he often makes good on it. Mm -hmm. So as you are saying there, we're in a very dangerous uh, situation. And of course, we have to be very careful ourselves about, you know, before we underreacted, now, you know, there is a chance of overreaction and setting up one of these escalatory dynamics but you know that is on Putin because you know he's the guy who decided you know to amass all of these forces and you know people are seeing moving into uh, Belarus as a game changer now but I, that's the thing he keeps changing the game he's also you know threatening um sending you know hypersonic uh, you know cru cruise missiles to Cuba and Venezuela you know, to the Western Hemisphere, there's been, you know, uh, all kinds of commentary from people like Sergei Lavrov and others about Japan and basing and, you know, the United States positions there. So, you know, you're seeing a pretty wide based maximalist approach here that I agree with you is extraordinarily dangerous. Yeah. And it is perhaps the more frightening in that um, de facto uh, Russia is preeminently um, a, a military power. Uh, apart from its oil and gas reserves, which uh, make yes. some of the important players in that game, um, along with the United States, um, it, it is, uh, I think, between the two of them, 90% uh, of all the nuclear capacity in right. the world. And um, if, if Putin, um, as no doubt he is, is considering what the position of his country in the longer term is, um, it wouldn't be surprising that he would see or try to see what he could make of this particular Trump, to use the word, that he has. Um, because I, I think in the longer term, um, questions uh, arise about what exactly the position of Russia in the overall world scheme of things is. Uh, I was very struck um, uh, some months ago, uh, we had a speaker from uh, Russia um, who talked to us about the uh, situation in Russia today, and she was very, uh, she was very frank, and uh, she made it quite clear that uh, she and I suspect a lot of other Russians are very concerned about uh, Russia um, becoming a kind of hostage of China and uh, also losing what to her was its essential European identity. Yeah, I think that that's a real risk. And, um, you know, one of the things that one might, you know, recommend to Russia if we were in a you know, more rational environment at the moment was, you know, getting their own strategic balance, you know, kind of appropriately. I mean, they'll, they will need strategic autonomy, you know, in, in the context of China eventually. I mean, as we all are trying to grapple with how we manage uh, China. Although, you know, I think China's own trajectory is also, I think, somewhat uncertain, mm -hmm. um, you know, given demographic uh, changes, the, the lingering and on, ongoing effects of the pandemic, which have certainly affected their economy just as much as ours. I mean, these recent statistics coming out of China about now the kind of, uh, you know, slowdown in growth and, you know, the, um, in the population. Uh, which is obviously going to um, slow down, you know, growth in the economy. Mm -hmm. I think it was like four percent growth or something in the last year, so a real, uh, you know, diminution there. Their continued focus on um, zero COVID uh, policy. 
negative their vaccines have not been you know obviously all that successful and you know their own decoupling i mean we've been talking about the us decoupling from china but china's been decoupling as well i mean a literal way i mean it can't really get in at the moment mm -hmm. still this goes on with the olympics of course but you know there, there is um though um you know that um decision of russia's as you know we're pointing out here to kind of go all in with china uh, they'll say well that's you know the united states fault and europe's fault for sanctions etc but you know kind of creating uh, this sense of impending doom confrontation and war with europe doesn't really help does it yeah. and um you know i think that uk uh, defense secretary called this out in the last couple of days in a, uh, an essay and a statement when he said you know, Russia is not encircled by NATO. Only 6% of Russian territory abuts NATO countries. You know, the rest of it is Kazakhstan, Mongolia, and China, and, and then the Arctic, and then a bit, you know, to the United States over, you know, in the um, uh, North Pacific, you know, with the Aleutian Islands, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, this is, this is kind of, you know, nuts, really, uh, to um, basically keep this going we know why and you know I'm, I'm i am sympathetic to you know russia's ever you know enduring sense of um vulnerability you know historically and you know the kind of the, the way that they articulate this but this isn't the way to go to um, basically build a more secure stable environment around you especially when you know the russians themselves have a lot of historical legacy of friction with china uh, mm -hmm. uh, including the fact that Chinese do still see Russia as one of the colonial powers, along with the UK and you know many others who took some of Chinese territory in the 19th century. Well, indeed, I know that um, unofficially 1.5 million square kilometers of, of former Russian right. territory is contested by China. Um, That's right. And, which appears in school books and, and yeah, exactly. I mean, even though they signed that agreement really quickly in 2000 and, you know, kind of reaffirmed it all the time. I think that's also another reason why Russian postures so much. Right. Mm -hmm. It wants to show to China that it's a force to be reckoned with, that it's not a, you know, a lesser um, power on the world stage. Mm -hmm. And it wants to preclude the idea that China might predate on you know, territory and you know, say, hey, give us that back again as well. Mm -hmm. I, I run the risk of being characterized um, <clears throat> as a Russland Verstehr, uh, but um, it, it, it has struck me that uh, what George Kennan said in 1997 about the expansion of NATO and the consequences of doing it um, reads very prophetically now. Um, it, it was perhaps uh, a mistake, although one that can't be reversed, uh, to proceed as as uh, we did, uh, I say we, the West uh, generally, uh, and if we had to do it all over again, uh, perhaps uh, we would um, focus more on an overall European security architecture, you know, that is a, a phrase uh, which rings bells in Germany more than anywhere else, but it, it is persuasive to some extent, and um, I, I personally regret that something more wasn't done to pursue Gorbachev's vision of a common European house, a common European home. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, we, we did have the Partnership for Peace. <clears throat> I mean, I myself have forgotten about this because peace seems so you know, remote at this point. And, you know, kind of um, that was the model exactly addressing, you know, as you said, Project, the, um, you know, that, that dilemma you know, back in the day in the 1990s. I mean, I was a fairly junior, you know, scholar at that point. Um, you know, I remember George Kennan's um, admonitions. Um, I also, you know, then at that point was a PhD student with Richard Pipes, <clears throat> you know, no friend of the Soviet Union, mm -hmm. but who had exactly the mm -hmm. same analysis that this would be, you know, somewhat disastrous um, in, in the terms of the relationship with Russia itself. And remember, I mean, Professor Pipes was from Poland. And of course it was Poland's push along with um, you know, Hungary and the Czech Republic, and then later the Baltic states and Slovakia, you know, et cetera, to come into um, NATO because of you know, the nature of this is an alliance and people can apply that really push this in a different direction. Mm -hmm. and, you know, and again, a lot of people would say that if we could go back in time, you know, beefing up partnership for peace and thinking about you know, some kind of larger architecture you know, might be possible. I personally also think that you know, one of the major um, uh, you know, mistakes and episodes, and I take some personal responsibility for this because I was a national intelligence officer at the, at the time, and we were warning about the 
um, negative um, impacts of this, but we obviously didn't make ourselves clear enough, uh, was 2008 and the Bucharest summit when Georgia and um, Ukraine had applied for a membership action plan, there was an awful lot of resistance um, in uh, Europe precisely because of this, but everybody wanted to find a compromise and we didn't find a compromise. We found in fact, you know, just a recipe for disaster later mm -hmm. because an open door without, you know, a timeline and agreement, you know, kind of it put Ukraine and Georgia in the same category as Sweden and Finland, mm -hmm. where, you know, that kind of uh, made a lot of sense for their strategic you know, perspective. Whereas Ukraine and Georgia were not likely to get um, entry. And also, you know, kind of, you know, just like there'd been concerns about whether we'd be able to really defend, you know, the Baltic states and, you know, everywhere else, um, you know, there, there wasn't a fully thought out um, plan of how we would manage this. And some people think, you know, and you know, I tend to agree with them that now the bill is due, you know, from that kind of, you know, series of mistakes and not really kind of thinking through the consequences of everything. Um, you know, the, the Baltic states, certainly in Poland and others assumed that Russia would come back <laughs> and be more aggressive, you know, and a lot of other people had more of like, um, you know, an idea of, oh, they might remain weak. And that's, of course, got the Russians resenting uh, all the kind of the framing of this. And others thought, no, we'd really manage to have a much better relationship with them you know we'd have a strategic partnership but you know my colleague Angela Stent you know everyone knows quite well you know wrote that book the limits of partnership you know it's emphasizing that that was all misplaced so we've all made some blunders and missteps mm -hmm. that have brought us to this particular point and I do agree that you know had we had you know different thinking about this the partnership for peace other arrangements there you know early on in the 1990s you know we might be in a different place but again you know world affairs might have drawn us in this direction because I think one of the just to just very quickly point out that you know one of the um episodes or actually I think there are two episodes where uh people's minds are changed in Moscow one is 1999 and the bombing of Belgrade um during mm. uh, the standover of Kosovo where everybody in Russia decides that well NATO is still a military alliance that's kind of hell-bent on because they take it personally and think this is kind of a proxy for for, for Russia and, and you know turns around uh, exactly, and he's yeah. playing in midair and goes back, you know, we might have handled that one a bit better as well. And then, you know, we have 2003 and, you know, the US massive strategic blunder in deciding to invade Iraq. And then mm -hmm. Russia decides at that point that the US can't be trusted and the US is just in the business of regime change. Yes. In, in fact, in Bucharest 2008 is, is a very uh, curious phenomenon. Uh, because um, <clears throat> given the opposition of Germany and France, uh, they couldn't offer uh, membership action plans to uh, Ukraine and Georgia. But uh, it surprises me that everybody thought it was a compromise to state formally, Ukraine and Georgia will become members of NATO. Uh, in fact, they were put in a different category from that of uh, Sweden and Finland. That was, I think, uh, something that was not thought through. I agree with you. I mean, and in fact, I know it wasn't. <laughs> so there we are. So as I said, I was an national intelligence officer. We had lots of warnings, but, you know, all of the debates took place too late yeah, because yeah. they applied in January and nobody really did anything until, you know, February, March. I mean, you know, kind of, uh, and we were, everyone was a bit shocked that they sent these letters together, Ukraine and Georgia. I mean, there's a whole backstory to that. Because there wasn't, it wasn't anticipated they would ask, knowing that they didn't have the support. And then I think, you know, it was also incumbent on other NATO allies to have been much more forthright mm -hmm. in their opposition. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because okay. they kept, you know, waffling around mm -hmm. in the discussions with the principals, with George Bush and Dick Cheney, with us, you know, worker bees mm -hmm. in the background. They were being very frank, not going to happen. We're not going to do this. And I said, well, please tell, you know, because we're getting accused of, you know, being bad analysts and, you know, bad intel people because we're saying, well, you know, this is this and this thing. That's not what we're hearing. Uh, you know, and so, you know, we got undercut as well. And others, you know, in the State Department and elsewhere who, you know, might have in principle wanted to support um, Georgia and Ukraine, but knew that our European allies, you know, for the most part were opposed. And I think it was the UK and David Miliband and a number of others who helped to, you know, create what they thought was a face saving formula, but of course infuriated the Russians and it infuriated the Georgians and it made the Ukrainians and everybody nervous and, you know, probably got a lot of the other allies on edge as well. Yeah, let me move to, to some of the questions, uh, if you don't mind. Um, we have one from Dr. Noel O'Connor who says he really, 
enjoyed your book um, that you uh, highlight the issue of uh, the rise of populism in politics. Um, and he asks, how can traditional political parties re respond to such a shift on the ground? Um, and the second one from Shane Barry, which is more or less in the same area, has the idea of the meritocracy being pernicious in the long run. Uh, the, the winners have earned their place through hard work, while the left behind deserve their fate. Uh, meritocracy makes the status quo more palatable. Uh, this, of course, is, uh, is a theme of uh, several books that were written recently uh, and uh, has merit, I think. So what would you think um, in regard to those two observations? Well, I think they're all tied together, right? <clears throat> because, I mean, there is a very, you know, um, kind of strong body of thought among, you know, various people. People have their own you know, views on this, obviously, that um, they've got to where uh, they got by hard work and their own individual talent. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, I say in the book, eh, not so much, not so fast. You know, I did work extraordinarily hard. Mm -hmm. You know, I like to think that I've got some talent, but mm -hmm. I got a heck of a lot of help. Yeah. And, you know, kind of I got a lot of help at different points. And this is actually where I think the mainstream political parties need to sort of think about this for the mm -hmm. left behind places, you know, rural Ireland, you know, northeast of England, Midlands, you know, all the kind of places, Northern Ireland, Belfast, you know, you kind of name it, mm -hmm. uh, where you have to be much more responsive and much more connected to your constituencies. You know, if you're playing politics all the time in, be it in Westminster, you know, Whitehall or Washington, D.C., or just, you know, in Dublin, you know, kind of all, you know, any of the other capitals in there and you're not connected, you know, with people back home, that's where you're going to get yourself into trouble. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> as I talk about in the book, a lot of opportunities might be out there for people, but they can't take them. So mm -hmm. I talk, you know, in the book about various opportunities that I, you know, did have, like, you know, I had an opportunity to apply for Oxford. Mm -hmm. I had no actual chance in hell of actually getting in there, not because, you know, I wasn't necessarily capable of it, but first of all, you know, I went to a, a, a Rwanda resource uh, comprehensive school that was actually in, you know, the bottom tier of schools in the whole of the United country and uh, the United Kingdom, you know, in various assessments, because it used to be the old vocational and secondary modern school wasn't set up you know, for people uh, to do mm -hmm. A-levels. Um, you know, I had no preparation, never even seen an exam before. Um, the exam was all about philosophy. We didn't get philosophy in a comprehensive school in northeast of England. I wasn't even sure what it meant. You know, I remember at the time, I think the exam was on something like Schopenhauer's, you know, theory of the world. And I thought, first of all, is Schopenhauer a composer? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, you know, what am I supposed to do here? And then I remembered, you know, something from Tolstoy about, you know, the thing of the will. And I just thought, oh, I'll just adapt, you know, something from this. So, and it was just humiliating and embarrassing, you know. And then I go to an interview and I have no idea what to do. And that opportunity is just beyond my reach. It's there, but it's not realistic. Yeah. The other thing is that an awful lot of people also don't necessarily want to or, you know, um, go to an elite college. But they don't have the opportunities there for tra training and skills. The funding isn't there, mm -hmm. you know, for, um, you know, various apprenticeships. We're not focusing in on that. That's where political um, uh, leaders, members of parliament and others, you know, should be actually focusing their energies. And political parties need to not just, you know, be kind of seen to be representatives of elites from certain settings, but really kind of make an effort to diversify their membership. Most major institutions need to do that. So in the United Kingdom, since I've left, there has been an awful lot of um, effort being put into, you know, diversification of, you know, well, not so much the foreign service, but like of government. And, you know, I've done a lot of talks um, with people since where a lot more women represented, a lot more people from working class, you know, backgrounds, more, you know, racial and, you know, ethnic diversity, but not regional diversity. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's the bit that my book points out that really has not changed. There are still these real divisions and discriminations and opportunity based on where you are. And that's kind of reflected in the politics. So the reason that, you know, my hometown in County Durham voted for Brexit and voted then for, um, you know, a Tory MP for the first time since the creation of the constituency in 1885, because it was so fed up, you know, with members of parliament that were, you know, after a period of time, you know, increasingly from the, you know, 90s onwards, mm -hmm. just kind of, you know, carpetbaggers who were kind of coming up there for a safe seat because they had ambitions in London, you know, and elsewhere. And they didn't really care that much about the constituency. It used to be more that somebody was representing the constituency from the area and who was, you know, kind of really dedicated to local politics, not that interested in playing in the national stage. And so that is over time, 
you know, kind of with all the other dislocations happening, where people feel like the parties have lost the plot. And in the United States, for example, so my extended family in the US, my husband's one of 12 kids and he's got, you know, a sibling over every, you know, imaginable place in the Midwest. You know, some of, you know, my um, in-laws said to me, you know, during the 2016 campaign, well, I can't possibly vote for Hillary Clinton. Because, you know, she's palling around all the time with Hollywood celebrities drinking champagne, you know, giving these mega speeches for hundreds of thousands of dollars and she didn't come and visit here. Mm-hmm. So it's that kind of retail local politics, you know, with people with a connection that gets lost and the kind of sense that elites, you know, the people in the as a result, of the meritocracy, you know, people like you and me and others, you know, we've kind of got there just by dint of individual um you know, kind of uh, capacity. And actually, we haven't. We've, um, you know, all had some help along the way, families, friends, institutions. My entire education was paid for by County Durham's local education authority. I'd never have gone to college if there hadn't been any money there. Yeah, as Hillary Clinton said, it takes a village. It does take a village, but she seemed to have forgotten that, unfortunately, yeah. you know, and others have as well. So I'm it's putting that, putting that, you know, kind of sense of responsibility and agency back to the village, the community, which is very important as well. On the meritocracy question, I, I think, uh, you know, it, it's a fair comment in that um, it, the, the meritocracy, when you look at it closely, um, is made up not only of people like you, you and me, uh, but uh, there is a lot of greasing of the pathways into... Yeah. Uh, the institutions that uh, maintain the meritocracy, uh, which doesn't necessarily mean uh, that the most highly qualified uh, succeed. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I have a question from um, a colleague of mine. Um, uh, Rory Montgomery, who used oh, to. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, you know Rory. He asked, was there ever a serious opportunity for successive US administrations to have established a better and more stable relationship with Putin without abandoning basic principles? Well, you know, I think Rory actually, in the way that he framed the question, has just hit on something that's, you know, kind of I've been really concerned with for some time and I, I, you know, I haven't really got a good answer to it, unfortunately. So we think about because he says Putin, right? And successive administrations. That's part of your problem, right? Putin yeah. has been in power for 21, 22 years. And, mm-hmm. you know, basically that's one <laughs> continuous stretch of one, you know, essentially unitary actor. I mean, yes, he was prime minister for a while, but it wasn't like he went anywhere. And it's just a rearranging mm-hmm. of uh, the, the personnel that, you mm-hmm. know, Bob Lavrov has been uh, foreign minister for eons, uh, mm-hmm. you know, Peskov and uh, Gromov, you know, the press secretaries have been there, you know, everybody in that firmament around Putin, you know, there are some younger people have come in, you know, Vino, the um, <clears throat> the you know, chief of staff, you know, protocol guy who then rose up and has gone into, you know, different positions. But essentially, it's the same team of people. Mm-hmm. And, you know, kind of, you know, Sergei um, Bryabkov, the deputy foreign minister. I mean, he's been there, you know, in a long time, et cetera, et cetera. We just come and go. Yeah. And I think that's the problem. And how do we structure some continuous touch points? Um, you know, under Trump, of course, um, he was just all over the place, constantly changing national security advisors, secretaries of state, <laughs> people like me, you know, off we will go the whole time, off with our heads and we were off, you know, to something else all the time. And the Russians got deeply frustrated mm-hmm. because they felt that they had to keep starting again to explain with people. Now, that's part of our you know, strength, but it's also um, a weakness for things like this. So how could we create some permanent structures? I mean, we were to have the NATO, um, uh, Russia uh you know uh forum you know the format that we mm-hmm. created there um the council i mean that you know kind of then suffered from all these ups and downs in other you know sets of bilateral relationships you know perhaps if we really had you know early on as we were talking you know set up you know some kind of larger structures in the 1990s we might have a forum in which we could all take something too i mean we keep wanting to take it back to the osce look at you know the way we structured bilateral meetings in um, Geneva under the rubric of these strategic stability talks. Uh, NATO, Brussels, you know, the re- reaffirming again the NATO-Russia Council format. And then the OSC and the Russians said, oh, we don't want the OSC. And look, the EU tried to talk to them. No, bugger off, we don't want to talk to the EU. <laughs> you know, they want to talk to the US, but the thing is there's not a US to talk to. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. There's just constant changes. And I think one of the reasons that the Russians are gunning for something now with Biden and the team, they know them. They've talked to them before under Clinton and Obama. And, you know, now they're all back. And they want to get something resolved before we're off to the races again at the, uh, in the US with the midterms. And then, you know, could everybody could change over again. Yeah. And I, I do think this is a problem. And I'm if Rory and others have got some good ideas. I know, I mean, during the Cold War, we had all kinds of, mm. you know, transatlantic formats. We need to seriously think about how can we structure something? Of course, you know, this might now be in some post-conflict environment. You know, I can't say right now what's exactly going to happen. But trying to find something that gives some permanent group to be talking about this, like we've had in the past, yeah. you know, seems fairly important. Yeah. In, in other words, find something now that we should have found 20 years ago. Yeah, I mean, I mean, we really did need that. And again, I mean, how you structure something like that. And then you do have that dilemma, of course, as you know, European allies and others saying, look, you don't want the US, you know, doing this over our heads. And, you know, the OSC does seem, you know, that kind of format, the right format. We keep coming back to that Helsinki arrangements. But the Russians have said, no, you know, we don't want that. They want a concert of Europe. You know, just them <laughs> and you know a couple of others selected you know kind of thing to do it we have a question here from um a former secretary general of the irish ministry of foreign affairs noel door oh, um, right. who says a sovereign state such as ukraine now is should be free to choose its international alignment on the other hand an irish foreign minister frank aiken addressing the security council during the Cuban missile crisis in 1962 seem to suggest that small countries placed beside powerful neighbors with whom they may have disputes had a kind of responsibility. They ought to ensure that they will never be used as a base for attack on that neighbor. He recalled um, Eamon de Valera's assertion about Ireland and the UK um, during World War II and commended it to Cuba. The US in 1962 simply would not tolerate Russian missiles in Cuba. He goes on, without in any way comparing the present case with Cuba uh, or impugning Ukraine's sovereignty or approving Putin's belligerent chess game, is there an argument in prudence for a sovereign Ukraine to decide that it would not join NATO, which Putin perceives as hostile? You know, I think that's the great way of formulating it, right? If Ukraine decides, yeah. like Ireland did, you know, um, to, um, you know, assess this in its own way without, you know, being at the force of, you know, point of a bayonet. I completely agree with that. I mean, I think that yeah. is a, 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 but, you know, Ukraine has to have, you know, the sovereign independent right to decide that. Because I mean, everybody yeah. else is talking about a sort of a forcible imposition of that yeah. kind of scenario that when they talk about Finlandization, but look, Finland choose to jo chose to join the European Union. When you start thinking about Finlandization, people are talking about, you know, a period that Finns themselves bristle on because they really did defend their independence and sovereignty. They actually had the Irish maxim that they were kind of trying to sort of figure out there about how they were going to manage that relationship. They're members of the EU and they'd still reserve the right to join NATO if they want to, if they should choose. Austria, you know, totally different um, situation, pretty much, you know, kind of that was a, 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 a condition of uh, the um, ending of occupation in Austria in what was it, 1955, you know, for example. So we can't do this by force. I think that actually Ireland and other countries that have made similar decisions could actually play a very important role in this right now. If it was done in that larger international context to make that clear. I think that is a really, you know, wonderful way of looking at this. It gives a fresh perspective, you know, here to this, rather than it mainly looking like, you know, the United States or others are forcing this onto a country. But of course, that means that Russia has to, you know, de-escalate and basically pull back and give the space. But that, you know, it doesn't seem to be Russia's style at the moment. They want to force the issue and say, we, you know, secure this. And then, you know, there is the risk of Russia doing, as in fact they have done to Ukraine over all this period of time. You know, they were supposed to be guaranteeing, you know, Ukraine's um, sovereignty and independence when Ukraine gave up its nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm you know, in 1994, but what the Russians say is, and then Ukraine, you know, broke out of that neutral position and started to, you know, pursue uh, NATO. So that's why they're doing it. But, you know, they make it actually more difficult to achieve the kind of outcome uh, that we're describing here. So we have to figure out how to get to that point so that Ukraine make, can make that decision itself. Yeah, it's a, it's a very delicate one. I recall being in Berlin some uh, couple of years ago talking about this to um, German colleagues um, and 
it occurred to me in the course of the conversation to, to, to say that um, if, if Ukraine adopted a, a position analogous to that of Switzerland and the European system, uh, it, it would resolve the problem. And the answer came back quite rightly. It, it can't be done over the head of the Ukrainians. That, yeah, exactly, exactly right. And I mean, that's kind of you know, the, the position that was um, carefully formulated by Ireland. Yeah. I mean, again, an attack on um, Ukraine by Russia right now would put the jeopardy and into jeopardy, you know, even the, you know, the, the concepts of independent sovereignty that Ireland has maintained in all of this period. Because, I mean, you are, again, another country that's come out of an empire and you've had to fight yeah. for your independence yeah. and sovereignty. And, you're you know, plenty of people can make claims on Ireland, you know, right? So I'll, you're in a favorable <laughs> geographic position, Fiona. Yes. Well, yeah, you, but you still, you know, you're kind of pretty close to the other guys. <laughs> Dan O'Brien, who is the economic director um, of the Institute, um, asks um, two questions. Uh, one, do you foresee Finland and Sweden joining NATO? Um, two, over the long term, do you envisage the EU developing a defense capability separate from NATO stroke the US? Well, I think on the latter, um, that really kind of depends on, you know, where we end up at the, at the end of all of this, right? I mean, yeah. I think, you know, before we've been wanting to have those conversations about the future of European security, I mean, we really should have been having this for some time, but always, you know, the risk was, was you know, particularly after 2008, you know, when you think about the, you know, NATO strategic concept in 2010, and then, you know, those relationships with the EU, you know, how do you work on this out when you've got, you know, basically somebody else screaming <laughs> the whole time, you know, you're, you know, kind of um, illegitimate, you shouldn't be here. And, you know, like in 2014, um, the annexation of uh, Crimea and the war in Donbass took place uh, on the, uh, in part, on the premise that an, an association with the European Union or the part of Ukraine would lead to a backdoor to NATO, mm -hmm. because Russia read the small print that, you know, I and others hadn't. I mean, I was like, what? What are they talking about? God, this is the EU. They said before this was fine. But then mm -hmm. when you start to look down the list of European security and defence policy cooperation, that's also in cooperation with NATO. So, you know, when the Russians, you know, going through this with a you know, kind of a fine tooth comb, as they say, you know, start to see all of this there, they're right, that's not, that's not going to happen. So again, it's squeezed that space to have that kind of discussion about mm -hmm. how you reconfigure um, European security arrangements. And, you know, we ought to have that 30 years on. It is preposterous that the United States is, you know, still sort of seen <clears throat> in that light as it was during the Cold War. Um, you know, Russia says it's all about the United States, of course, but we haven't had that space to really kind of figure this out. And I remember you know, the late and wonderful Zbigniew Brzezinski in 2010, you know, during some of the debates about the NATO strategic concept, bemoaning the fact that we didn't have much clarity and, and you know, and strategic thinking about where we all went from here. Yeah. And that was too much, you know, kind of um, thinking about the past arrangements. And of course, you know, he was not one to, you know, kind of discount Russian aggression, but it just said that that can't be just the whole, you know, kind of premise for, you know, kind of where we are and thinking. And, you know, many, of course, of us have grappled with the idea of how do you factor, you know, Russia into that in an ideal world, you know, what would uh, this um, look like? Um, the other um, part of the question I've kind of forgotten now, the first bit. Well, it was whether you taught Finland and Sweden. Might... Oh, yes, Finland, Finland and Sweden, because then that might actually, I knew there was something that I was trying to lead to there, that Finland and Sweden might have a, you know, a range of choices. Uh, but, you know, right now, Finland and Sweden do not want that door closed. Uh, and, and that's why an minister, the president of Finland, uh, has, you know, spoken out and, you know, where you've had previous Swedish governments, whenever Russia starts menacing them and, you know, suggesting that, you know, NATO should pull back, they actually assert they're still interest in NATO. But they might, you know, kind of, you know, be more comfortable, who knows, you know, in a, in a different configuration. I mean, Sweden and Finland uh, have very strong partnerships with NATO. I'm sure that if anything happened to them, we would do something, you know, major in support of them. Uh, I mean, they're serious partners. And, you know, I think, you know, to all intents and purposes, they function as if they are members of NATO. So, you know, that, uh, again, also needs to be thought about very carefully. And there's been actually a lot of resistance to um, closing the, the door to Ukraine and Georgia and other former Soviet states by some of the Scandinavian uh, and other countries because of Sweden and Finland. I mean, as you said, 
you know, Ukraine and Georgia actually got a promise that one day that they would uh, join NATO, which Sweden and Finland don't actually have. I mean, they have a more of a come in if you want to kind of thing. But it, it's that kind of idea that countries can choose to join that they want kept there. And, you know, the Norwegians, remember, I mean, when they first joined NATO, it was very difficult in the 1950s because they mm. had that border. Mm. And with the exception of um, Turkey, they were the only country that had a direct border with the Soviet Union. Yeah, yeah. But I think they have special um, arrangements whereby there won't be deployments on Norwegian yeah, exactly territory. Exactly. Obviously, see, there's all kinds of formulas there. And I think Norway is worth looking at as well. I mean, you know, yes. discussion with yes. the Norwegians about, you know, how would you structure something? How would you, you know, think about this? Um, Alex Conway, um, who is a researcher at the Institute, says um, Putin will presumably, he says, not be able to live forever. What does Russia look like once Putin leaves the global stage? And what does that mean for Russia's relations with Europe and the US? Uh, that's a big question. Oh, I wish I had that crystal ball. <laughs> uh, I mean, the thing is, you know, of course, we do, you know, game this out. And, you know, we shouldn't, you know, make any assumptions about the kind of person who comes in, right? I mean, look at Venezuela, um, <laughs> Maduro, it could get a lot worse, uh, you know, kind of uh, after... Chavez left the scene, but look also at Gorbachev emerging. Um, you know, Russians, of course, would be not happy to you know, make that kind of comparison because what happened into Gorbachev, you know, at the end of the Soviet Union, the unraveling. But Gorbachev was definitely a different person, different style, different, um, you know, approach and outlook to the people before. Medvedev, when he was, you know, kind of there as the understudy <laughs> stepping up into the presidency, had a different style and approach. And, you know, there was uh, a lot, you know, of, of different things could have happened, you know, had he stayed on in office and had Putin actually, in fact, left the scene. You know, so I, I would just say, I mean, there are lots of different outcomes, but it's the manner in which he departs. Yeah. And, you know, obviously we've seen um, a lot of signs that he wants to choose his successor, just as Yeltsin chose him, for the same kinds of reasons. Look at Kazakhstan. I mean, actually, you know, that looks a little dodgy now um, because, you know, it isn't always a given that the successor can keep things under control. And one of the rationales, in fact, for Putin coming back in 2011, 2012, was he felt that, you know, Dmitry Medvedev didn't have a strong hand at the wheel of the state. And there was an economic crisis and there was all kinds of upheavals everywhere. And, you know, maybe he needed to get back in there and take control again. So, you know, handing off um, even to a chosen successor is also risky, depending on what's happening in circumstances. And I think one of the reasons that he had the amendment to the Constitution so that he could stay on, I mean, he, he might not intend to stay on until 2036. He's given himself the option, but it's also because, you know, that maybe there's never a good time, <laughs> you know, to hand off. And he wanted to give more time, not to be, you know, forced to keep to this timetable of 2024, which might be from his and others' perspective, artificial. Then again, you know, there's a lot of speculation now that he's been hidden away for the last two years in splendid isolation, hiding from COVID. Maybe there's something going on with his health. You know, maybe he has some... Um, you know, susceptibility that could be quite dangerous. Maybe, you know, that's it. It's the wild card. Like you said, can't live forever. Maybe, you know, there's some health issue. We don't know that. But that then creates this uncertainty and instability in the system. If he dies tomorrow, you know, heaven forbid, falls down a flight of stairs, you know, kind of all these things. I mean, we've run scenarios like this before. Um, you know, there is a succession uh, plan, but then there could be an absolute free for all. And we don't know how that's going to play. I mean, look in Kazakhstan again. Uh, there's it looks seems to have been a lot of palace intrigue and power struggle going on behind the scenes of the protests there it's not you know very um let's just say reassuring <laughs> to no. think in those lines it's so the, i think we have to be prepared you know buckle up just yeah. like we have to buckle up right now because we don't know what he's going to do it's the dilemma of all autocrats um they can't conceive of a succession and so they extend their period in office and as you say that's right Nur Sultan Nazarbayev is an example of it. Yeah, um, exactly right. Mary Cross, who is a, a board member of the Institute, um, says that it seems very unlikely that any form of economic sanctions would deter Vladimir Putin given the capacity of the Russian people to bear pain. So would you conclude that we have no real deterrent? We have some deterrence. I mean, I, I, I share, you know, the same um, scepticism. I do think, however, that sanctions did work in 2014 mm -hmm. after MH17, the Malaysian Airlines was shot down because there was an immediate response that the Russians weren't really 
banking on everybody you know got in on the sanctions act and they pulled back from you know that push forward to Mariupol, Hurston and all these other places that looked like that they were you know trying to mess with in some form and you know kind of uh, consolidated their gains uh, for a while but you know you can only keep doing that kind of thing so much and you know, I think they're already factoring in that there will be sanctions and trying to figure out how they will respond to it mm. you know if they're taking out swift alternative payment systems c- cryptocurrencies you know kind of whipping up you know, kind of anti-sanctions fervor, which is easy to do, <laughs> not just um, in uh, Europe, but elsewhere where people, you know, worry about the weaponization of uh, the US financial system and want to push back. I mean, Iranians, you know, try to do that. And look, I mean, Ireland, plenty of protests that I got from, you know, your um, Irish leadership when um, uh, Rusal and Darapaska were sanctioned because of, you know, the aluminium plants and things mm-hmm. in Ireland and, you know, elsewhere. I mean, that's what the Russians have got quite a bit of leverage. They've got people on their payroll that they can, you know, um, uh, you know, basically uh, tap into. And that's actually one of the things that we can do. We can clean up our act. Mm-hmm. You know, we can, you know, kind of close up all these loopholes because lots of them are just loopholes in our regulations that allow, you know, Russian oligarchs and others to sort of swan around at will. Uh, in European um, settings, you know, kind of oligarchs having mansions in, you know, everywhere imaginable. Say again? And American settings. I was going to say that. I was just about to say, and, you know, everything from Trump Tower to shell companies in South Dakota and Delaware, you know, Joe Biden's home state and Miami. And, you know, all the people who are on the boards of Gazprom, which, you know, includes some of my former colleagues in government, and, you know, George Osborne working for Deripaska and former Senator Lieberman working for, you know, a Chinese, you know, telecom community. We can stop this. You know, we can actually blunt a lot of the leverage and influence that they have. We can sanction ourselves. Yeah. But I think we can also take this international, just like all of these really good comments about, you know, the role of Ireland, the comments during the Cuban Missile Crisis, getting other countries to stand up there and say, hang on a second. This affects my interests, my independence and sovereignty. I'm in the same boat as Ukraine. You know, I've been you know, all the old colonial powers and you know others that got their independence after World War One, World War Two, and onwards that are enshrined in the you know the guarantees of the international system. Just shows now that there's no guarantee, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm not suggesting Ireland's going to be invaded tomorrow, but I mean, any other country you know around the world that has a hostile neighbour that thinks that their territory belongs to them or there's some historical you know legacy there that can you know, be uh, refuted. Um, I mean, just look at the struggles over right now over, you know, Northern Ireland and the Good Friday Accords because of, you know, kind of um, UK prerogative and, you know, the EU institutional arrangements. I mean, all of these things become much more complicated if another country thinks it can act with impunity. And so I do think that there is, you know, cleaning up our own act, making it much more difficult for Russian money to have influence and, you know, le- leverage, you know, in our economies and politics. Um, you know, honestly, um, former government officials should be ashamed of themselves. They know better than this, you know, kind of working for, you know, Russian companies that are used for political leverage. I'm sorry. You just get out of that right now. Yeah. And then, you know, kind of, um, you know, basically figuring out how we take this on a bigger stage. Like Gerhard Schroeder. Yes. I mean, I was thinking about him, but I thought I'd just, you know, use a few closer to home as well. <laughs> a last question um, from Horst Schiedslag, who is a a German national who lives here and is a member oh, of the right. yeah. um, and has a lot of experience in NATO. Um, he asks about Putin's proclaimed threat perception from NATO. Does he not have enough in-depth information about the real capabilities of NATO today? You know, I think that that might be, you know, one of the problems as well, because he is, um, like many of us, a um, uh, product of the Cold War, um, you know, I decided to study Russian against the backdrop of the war scare of, you know, November 1983. That's, you know, when like we're all going to get blown up. I mean, you probably remember this and I do. I mean, it was a pretty scary time. I mean, I obviously do not remember the Cuban Missile Crisis, but I certainly remember that. And, you know, kind of Putin in that um, time frame is that's in his, you know, kind of rise in the KGB, you know, such as it was, you know, he's stationed later on, you know, in, in Dresden, um, you know, it's all all in that kind of mix. And he has that Cold War perspective on NATO and the NATO threat. And, you know, he still thinks of NATO as the United States occupying Europe, you know, kind of the standoff, you know, across the Berlin Wall, etc., uh, against Soviet forces. And, you know, still 
great concern about the conventional our nuclear capacity of the United States that it can't prevail upon. And the thought then that, you know, it's that cumulative impact of NATO. He doesn't think of it as an alliance. I mean, when he's saying that NATO needs to withdraw, is he saying that US needs to withdraw as well? Mm -hmm. And very much thinking of it in Cold War terms. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the CSTO was set up in a way as to be the poor man's version of the WTO, the World Warsaw Trade Organization. And sometimes I say WTO, people go, the wood. Yeah, World Trade Organization, what are you talking about? The Warsaw Pact, you know, which we keep forgetting about. And, um, you know, he still thinks in those terms that this is just a cover for the United States and in the Cold War sense. So he's also sitting in a bubble, um, two years of, you know, hidden away, you know, from people. What kind of advice is he getting? Mm -hmm. You know, is he just using, you know, his old, you know, patterns of thinking and, you know, what kind of information is there, there? What information is there really about Ukraine and the state of play there? I do wonder about this. And I, I do think there's a lot of mirror imaging and past patterns that have been projected, you know, onto the current situation. I worry about that very much. Yeah. And I suppose you could say that historically, uh, people in power in Russia have always felt that they were surrounded and uh, threatened from all sides. And the expansion of the Russian Empire was the result of this in many Absolutely. ways. Absolutely. Yeah. And they always worry more about encirclement in the West than they do in the East. Although, frankly, if you're that long border with China, mm. not, I'm not wouldn't be worried about Mongolia or Kazakhstan. But I mean, they do, you know, kind of start to think. And then they are worried now about the Arctic. Mm. You know, the pushing out of um, sovereignty claims on the continental shelf. Um, and it's just, you know, all comers. I think China worries them there too with its um, uh, increased interest in Arctic positions. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a frame that they can't get themselves out of, even though as Ben Wallace says, you know, in, um, you know, factual, um, uh, you, know, um, you know, factual frame here, you know, just looking at it, 6% of your territory abutting NATO, that's ridiculous. How is that encirclement? But, you know, as you said, it's really that perceptions, it's your mental maps and Putin's mental map is that of the Cold War. Mm -hmm. Fiona, it's been a pleasure uh, talking to you. Um, we uh, benefited greatly from uh, your views on a, quite a range of subjects. And I thank you for the spirit in which you dealt with uh, the uh, variety of questions that are thrown at you. Um, we benefited greatly from it. We hope um, that when all this is over, we will have the honor and the pleasure of welcoming you in person to Dublin again. Oh, I would love to. Yeah. I was saying before that my last visit was the 100th anniversary of the Easter uprising and the Irish census. And I was counted in the census. So I'm going to come back. <laughs> yes, you'll be welcome back. Yeah, Thanks. All uh, the very thank best everybody everyone. in the audience uh, for your questions. And sorry, I couldn't reach them all. Um, and until the next time. All the best. Thank you so much.